Hello and welcome. My name is Dave Bodie for Envato. And in this video, I'm gonna show you how to use this animated handwriting typeface for After Effects to create a really cool looking write-on effect for your projects. And in fact, I'm gonna show you how to take this fairly basic write-on effect and really kick it up a notch and make it look like ink on paper. It's a really cool effect, and I hope you check out the entire tutorial to see how it's done. So first, let me show you the basic idea here, all right? This is a scripty kind of write-on effect. Now, if you've ever tried to do this, you'll find that it's not terribly hard to do these write-on effects, no matter what the typeface is. However, it is fairly tedious. And with this template available on Envato Elements, that makes the process a lot faster. Now, if you're unfamiliar, Envato Elements is a subscription-based digital asset library where you can find everything from stock video to video templates, music, sound effects, graphics, graphics templates, photos, 3D assets, and a lot more. They have a broad commercial license, so you can use these assets in all of your projects. So to get started, you can download the project file. It'll be a zip file. When you unzip it, you're gonna have this collection of folders and files. And all we really need to get started is this After Effects project file right here. Now, before we jump into After Effects, I just wanna make a note that there is one external file that you'll need for this project, and that is the font that this project uses. But not to worry, it's available for free. And the link for this is in the project files, but if you want, you can just find it at this address right here. It's on fontsquirrel.com. So now I'm just gonna open up the After Effects project file. When you do, it's gonna pop up a warning and we can just click okay. All that's saying is that the project was created in an older version of After Effects. It needs to be converted to whatever version you are currently running. You might also get a Resolve Fonts dialog box that pops up. Not to worry, we can just click okay here as well and the project will open right up. I believe there is maybe another font in this project somewhere, but I haven't found that to be a problem. So you can just click OK and everything should work just fine. Now, before we jump in and dig in and find out what's in this project, I want to make sure that your screen is somewhat matching my screen so that it's easy for you to follow along. If for whatever reason your screen doesn't look like my screen, not to worry, just hop on up here to the menu and go to Window, Workspace, and make sure that it's set to Standard. If it is set to standard and it still doesn't look exactly like mine or pretty close to it, go down here and choose reset standard to saved layout. And that'll move things around and you should have something very close to what you're seeing on your screen right now. All right, so this is opened up to a comp called write your text here. And if I hit the space bar, we can just kind of preview what's going on here. And you can see this is a really nice looking scripty font in a write on effect really great looking. It's a little bit slow, but not to worry. We can fix that right up. No problem. Now I'm going to come over here to the project panel and I'm going to click on the new composition button and create a new comp here. And I'm going to name this comp what I want my text to say. So just going to call it this changes everything. I'm going to make my comp 1920 by 1080. 23.976, or you can pick whatever frame rate that you want. I'm gonna make this about one minute long and then click okay. I'm also gonna close these other comps here because I don't really need those right at the moment. Actually, I don't want this to be 1920 by 1080. I want my final graphic to be 1920 by 1080. But for this text, I want this to actually be a little bit bigger. So I'm gonna jump back into the comp settings here which is control K on the keyboard. And I'm gonna make this 2200 by, I don't know, 450. I basically want this to be a little bit bigger and that way, if we zoom up on the text, it's still gonna look nice and crisp and clean. So the way that this project creates the text is it uses a script, which essentially automates the process of adding the individual characters. You might've seen when we first opened up the project, there's a folder here called letters. And inside that folder, you have basically all the characters that you need to write out anything that you want to say. And you could add those manually, but I don't really recommend it. That's not going to be super fun. So to run the script, come on up here to file scripts, run script file. 
And then inside your Grace animated handwriting folder, you'll find a folder called script. You double click that. And then if we change the file type down here to Adobe JavaScript binary file, you'll see the script that we want to run. So I'm just going to select that and click open. And there's the script right here. It's called typefacer. So this is really simple. I'm just going to type my text here. This changes everything and then click the go button. Sequence layers is checked, which is what I want. So let's see this get to work here. And just like that, it's built the entire text. So if we pull the CTI with the playhead back to the beginning here and press spacebar, we can see what this looks like. Okay, that's pretty slow. So I'm just gonna scrub along here manually and see this looks great. That looks really fantastic. I don't need this typefacer script panel open anymore, so I'm just going to close that to get rid of it. And I'm just going to select all my layers here in the comp with control A and then press U to just kind of collapse them all so we can see. And you can see that every single layer here or every single character, I should say, is on its own layer. And that's basically how this is built. And that script basically automates pulling all of those layers in and sequencing them putting them in the right order and offsetting them in time so that they all happen just at the right time. Like I said before, this is too slow, but that's going to be something I fix in just a minute. Now up at the very top of the comp, we have a null layer. And if we click on the source name, you can see that this is actually named text controller one. And if we pull up the effects controls, which is not visible right now, we'll just go to window and then right down here, effects controls, we can see that this has a few effects on it and we can adjust some of the things in this title here. So I can change the tracking, which will space everything out. But I actually think the default tracking looks pretty good. There's a few things that I want to go in and change manually, but I'll do that in a second. The other thing that I want to change is the font size. And I'm just going to bump that up to, I don't know, something like 52. I just want to make this kind of fill the space here. So maybe I'll just push this up a little more. Okay, that was, I overshot that a little bit. No problem. Something like that. And I'll also just trim this down using the region of interest down here. So I'll draw a rectangular marquee or a rectangle shape here. It's pretty much the only kind of shape that you can draw and just kind of get this box really close to the text and then come up here to the menu, go to composition and crop comp to region of interest. There we go. Now this is basically all there is to it. Now, if you want to get in here and make any changes to the individual characters, you can, for example, you may be, or maybe your client is particularly picky about how these characters line up. And they may say, well, I'd like this S here to just kind of B to the left a little bit. That's no problem. I just selected the S down here and you can move it over with the arrow keys until it looks just right. And you'll find that there are a few things like maybe this GES here. So I'll just select the GES it is not quite aligned exactly how you might want it to be. Maybe pull the E over just a, just a hair there. I think that's plenty good enough for now. The next thing I want to do is I want to pull my this changes everything comp into a new comp. I'm going to hit the enter key and rename that to this changes everything underscore timed. And what I want to do here is I want to get the timing for this title right. It'd be too cumbersome to go back in this comp and kind of retime everything. But if I drop it in this comp right here, uh, that's not going to be a problem. Essentially, what I want to do is make this faster. I'm going to turn off transparent pixels here before I get to work. And so what I need to do is enable time remapping. There's a keyboard shortcut for that, or you can just right click on the layer here, go to time, time remapping. The shortcut is control alt T if you prefer to do it that way. So to time remap this, what I'm going to do is just scrub here until I see the last dot come on. Yeah, so right about here, and then I'm going to add a keyframe and then I'll go to the end here and select this last keyframe and I'll just get rid of it. And so now I have my first keyframe when the animation starts and then 
essentially the animation stops right here because there is no other keyframe after this. And so to get this faster, I'm just going to grab this end keyframe here and pull it over here to the left. And now it's going to play really quick. And maybe that's, maybe that's still just a little too slow. I think I'd actually like this in about five seconds. So something like this, I think will work fine. Now, I don't really like the speed at which it's playing, or I should say, I like the speed, but I don't like the end and the start speed. So instead of these linear keyframes, I'm going to change this to a Bezier curve. So essentially what I want it to do is I want the animation to start slower and then pick up speed. And then I want it to sort of slow down at the end so that I, I can see a little bit of this right on effect. And that's super easy to do. I'm just going to select my keyframes here and hit F9 on the keyboard, and that's going to apply an easy ease. So just by doing that, it's going to look a little bit better, but the end is still not slow enough for me. So with my keyframes selected, I'm going to jump into the graph editor here, and I'm going to select the ending keyframe. And I'm going to grab this speed handle here, or this influence handle, and I'm going to pull this out to like, I don't know, 80 something. I think above 80 works pretty well. And I'm also going to select the starting keyframe and pull that out to the right. I'm also holding shift while I do this so that I don't kind of pull this off kilter in any direction. And I'm going to pull this out to about, I don't know, 50 something. And so what I'm looking at here, and you may not have the same uh, graph, but I'm looking at the speed graph. There's another graph called the uh, value graph, but most of the time I like to look at the speed graph. And so essentially the speed graph is showing you the speed of the animation where we're starting slow. It's kind of building up right here. And then we start to slow down towards the end. So let's check out what that looks like. Perfect. <laughs> that looks great. Just like that. It's exactly what I wanted. I'm going to jump out of the graph editor. And then I'm going to show you how to kind of kick this up a notch, because if you stopped here, well, you know how to use the project file and you're good to go. Actually, before we jump any further, I should save this. So I'm just going to really quickly save this. That's a good thing to do. Normally I save right away, uh, but sometimes when I'm recording tutorials, I forget, but always save your work uh, often, save early and often. That's, uh, that's my motto. So let's say for a second you have access to Envato Elements, you're following along in this video, you're having a great time. Well, if you do have access to Envato Elements, you can download this project file, but also you'll have access to a bunch of the other assets. And I found some really cool backgrounds that I'd like to show you how we can use those backgrounds and those textures to really kick this up a notch. So one of those is this uh, item here, it's called 21 Paper Textures. So I downloaded that. I also found this really gorgeous looking watercolor paper backgrounds, and uh, I downloaded that as well. And I'm going to grab two of those textures and pull them in to my project. So I've already downloaded and unzipped those, and I'm just going to grab one of these paper textures here. And I think I like this purple one here. I actually don't like the color of it, but you'll see once we look at it uh, more zoomed in, it's got a really nice texture that I think works pretty well. In the watercolors here, I'm just going to pick one that I think looks pretty good. I actually like this one. I think that looks pretty good. Or maybe this one right here. Man, they, they all look good. I'm going to go with this one. I'm going to pull this into my project right here. And for the sake of organization, I'm just going to drop these in a folder and name that textures. All right. So now I'm going to create a new comp. I'll call this main title. Oops. And I am going to make this 1920 by 1080. In this, I only really need, I don't know, maybe eight seconds long, something like that. I think that works. So to start, I'm going to grab my paper underscore 15, and I'm going to pull that down here. Put that right inside the comp here. It's going to take a second because this is a this is a pretty big image here. It's a lot of uh, a lot of megapixels, and you can see at 100% scale, this has a really cool look to it. It's got some nice texture and it's very evenly lit, which is very nice. I'm going to hit the W key to bring up the rotation tool. And I'm just going to rotate this 90 degrees to make it uh, more aligned 
with the aspect ratio of my project. I'm going to grab one of the transform handles and while holding shift, pull that in. I'm going to scale that down to uh, a little bit closer to the size of my project. Something like that will work. Now, I don't really like this color like I mentioned before, so I'm going to apply some effects to change that. One of those is going to be a tint effect. That's going to make this black and white. And another one is going to be a curves effect. So I'm going to throw that on here as well. And I'm going to brighten it up a little bit with the RGB curves. Then I'm going to jump into the red channel. And actually, I'm going to leave the red channel alone. But I'll jump into the green channel and I'll pull that down a hair. And then the blue channel and I'll pull that down a little bit more than green. And then I'll make this nice kind of beige color here. And I think that looks pretty good to start. Down in my timeline, I'm going to press the Enter key and just rename this to uh, BG. And that way I know what I'm looking at here. Now, I'm going to grab my This Changes Everything comp and pull that in. And I'll just resize that so that it kind of fits in the middle here. And so you can see what I have going on so far. It's not spectacular, but we're getting there, right? What I want to do is... Uh, I'm going to pull down this watercolor texture and I'm going to put it below my title. I'm going to scale that in so it just kind of covers my title. Maybe push it up uh, here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my title as an alpha map. So if I hit F4 on the keyboard, I'm going to change the 11. Actually, I'm just going to rename that. Watercolor. I'm going to change the watercolor layer to alpha map. And when I do, you, you can see that it's going to use the title as the alpha mat, and it's going to be using that layer's transparency to reveal the pixels in my watercolor layer. And you're saying, well, that doesn't look great. And it doesn't right now. But if we change the blend mode to something like, I don't know, linear burn, then it starts to look pretty cool. So we have kind of the colors of the watercolor layer, but we're seeing the texture of our paper behind it. And that looks pretty cool. Now we're gonna kick things up a little bit further by applying a roughen edges effect to our title layer right here. And now the default settings don't really work, but I wanna change this to spiky. I think that works pretty well. And, and you can kind of experiment with uh, what you think works pretty well. I found that these settings work pretty decently, setting the edge type to spiky, the border to 3.5, the fractal influence to, I don't know, something a little bit less, maybe 0.5. Uh, the scale, maybe turn that down to, I don't know, 60 something. What I'm looking for here is just to have the edge broken up a little bit. And uh, I think that kind of works. We can go back and adjust those in a little bit, but I think more or less that works just fine. Now I'm going to select these two layers here. I'm going to change their layer color to purple, and then I'm going to duplicate them with control D. And then on this bottom set of layers here, I'm going to change this to green. And what I'm going to do with this bottom set of layers is apply a few more effects here to get kind of a fatter kind of ink effect. So to start, I need a Gaussian blur. So I'm going to search for that here and I'm going to apply that. I'm going to pull that above my rough and edges. And I'm going to turn that up to something like, I don't know, 15, 16, 17, something like that. And I'll just I'll just solo this up so you can see what's going on here. Now, it doesn't really look like it's done anything, um, but to help it look a little bit nicer, I'm also going to add a curves, uh, C-U-R-V, there we go, curves effect. And I'm going to pull that up above my rough and edges because these effects do render in a particular order. And I'm going to change the channel to alpha and then I'm going to grab this top point here and I'm going to pull it to the left and you're going to see what that's going to do. That's going to fatten up this text significantly. So here's, here's the kind of original inky sort of looking layer. And then here's our fatter looking layer over here. And this is getting in the neighborhood. The other thing that I want to do is I want to duplicate my rough and edges effect. And so 
control D on the keyboard, or you can come up here to edit duplicate. And then I'm going to take this first rough and edges effect, and I'm going to push the scale up quite a bit and then turn the fractal influence up kind of all the way. And then maybe adjust the border uh, to really kind of give this a little bit more of a randomized sort of look. Um, and you're going to have to play with whatever you think kind of looks right. And it may involve maybe backing these down a little bit, maybe increasing the blur. So that's, that's kind of going in the right direction. And then what I do on the second kind of copy of the, uh, of the effect here is uh, maybe turn up the border a little bit more. And I think that's just maybe too blobby. Yeah, something like that, I think, looks pretty cool. You can also experiment with a different edge type. You know, maybe something like cut will work or uh, roughen. Um, I happen to think spiky looks pretty cool. Um, but just kind of adjust things so that they look just a little bit more random and splotchy. Now, if it's uh, for whatever reason you have kind of everything set, but the splotches aren't in the exact right position, you can come down here to evolution and just kind of push the evolution of this and that'll move the fractal effect, whatever kind of fractal is driving the effect and it'll give you a slightly different result. And so I like that. I think that looks pretty good. That's a, that's a good place to start. I might also pull down the opacity of this just a little bit. So now check out what happens when I play this. All right, we have kind of a, a neat effect here that looks like uh, kind of ink splotching. So right now I'd give this kind of a C. It's looking good, but it's not looking great. So one thing that'll help is if we get our text that's driving this sort of animation, to do something a little bit nicer. So I'm gonna jump back into my This Changes Everything timed layer, and I'm going to duplicate this a bunch of times, like, I don't know, 30 times. I'm gonna make a whole bunch of copies of this. Yeah, 30, let's, let's go with 30. And let's just solo the first one here. And on this first one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply an effect called Simple Choker. <laughs> and what I want to do is I want to choke, increase the choke to kind of make this uh, a little bit thinner. All right, so kind of like this. And watch what happens as this plays. You'll see it kind of starts with these little, these little strokes here. And so the idea is I want to make this pretty thin and then... I'm going to copy this effect and I'm going to paste it to the next layer. And on this layer, I'm just going to decrease the amount of choke. So I may do, I don't know, something like 13. Just have it kind of go down by twos. I'll paste it here and have it go down to 11. On the next layer, I'll paste it and have this go down to nine and so on and so forth. and then one. So that's not going to look great right away. However, what I want to do is I want to sequence these layers. So I want this to start with uh, this bottom layer here, and then the next frame start with the next layer up, and the next frame the next layer up. There's a really easy way to do that. I'm going to start by selecting my bottom layer and scroll all the way up to the top and hold shift and select all the layers. Then with all the layers selected, I'm going to right click go to Keyframe Assistant, Sequence Layers. I'm going to select Overlap. And if you'll recall, this comp is actually one minute long. And so I want to have an overlap of 59 seconds and 23 frames. And if I hit OK, what you'll see, hopefully, is that all of these layers are now one frame apart which is really cool. So watch what happens when I play this now. We get this kind of fattening up effect, which looks really, really cool. Now we can make this look even better by changing the opacity of all of our layers down to like 10. And now it'll have a really cool 
look to it. Where it looks like it's kind of fading in a little bit, like the ink's kind of dropping. And if you look at it closely, it doesn't look that great. Like if we zoom into 100%. However, when you look at the main title, and you see how this kind of animates on, it looks really cool. So this is going to play a little bit slow. So what I might suggest is that you pre-render just this part. And so what I would do is go and just scrub along here. And if, actually, if you hit U, you can just go to the top layer and figure out wherever that ends. And then maybe give that, I don't know, another two seconds or so. And then you can press N on the keyboard. Trim comp to work area. We'll just right click right there. And then I'll just add this to the render queue. So I'm going to press Control M. And I'm just going to send that to Adobe Media Encoder. And then I'm going to choose a format of QuickTime. And I'm going to use the preset GoPro Cineform 12-bit with alpha. The alpha is going to be important because we need that alpha channel basically for the title to, to look right. And I'm going to choose a spot for this to save. Click Save. And then get this start rendering. Hopefully, this should only take just a few minutes to render this out. I've now imported that back into my project. And so what I can do is I can make a copy of this in case I want to go back and change it. I'm going to go back into the original. This changes everything underscore timed. And my layers are all selected. I'm just going to delete them. And then in its place, I'm just going to pop my pre-rendered video, which is going to play back nice and quickly. And that's going to make the next few steps go a whole lot easier. All right, so if I jump back to my main title, nothing's really changed, except that it's going to go a little bit faster, which is very nice. And check out how cool this looks. This has a very sort of convincing looking kind of ink bleed effect, which is pretty cool. Now, for some final touches here, what I might do is take all of these layers and make them all 3D. And I'll also change my view here to active camera. And speaking of camera, I'm going to go ahead and add a camera. And I'll make this a one node camera, 35 millimeter preset, and click OK. Pull that up to the top here. I also want to add a null here to control my camera. And because there is a solids folder with like 400 nulls already in it, I'm just going to grab one of those and add it to my composition. I'm going to click on it and make it 3D and make it an adjustment layer so it doesn't render white. I'm going to rename it by pressing enter on the keyboard. Cam controller, or that's short for cam controller. And then I'm going to take my camera and parent it to this null. And essentially what I want to do for this little title here is I want to use this null as kind of a rotator. It's currently in the same position as all of these other layers. So if I rotate this on the Y, you can see that it's going to rotate kind of nicely. So what I want to do is I want to start at this kind of rotation, maybe something like, I don't know, 50 degrees. It won't make it quite that drastic. And then pull up the camera's position. And I'm going to kind of push this in here and adjust the position to get nice and tight on this uh, first character here that's, that's beginning to animate. Something like that. I think if I press AA, yeah, I think depth of field is on. I'm going to turn this off for now, but I'll turn it back on in just a minute. I'll press P to bring up the position again and just, and just set a position keyframe here. And then I'm going to go to the end of the animation. And what I'd like this to do is just kind of whip around here. So something like this, maybe to this side, I don't know, negative 50 ish, and then push the camera's position over here. Something like this. Maybe a little bit less. I want to be able to kind of read it. But you know, something like that. I don't know, whatever looks kind of right. You can also just take this background here and increase the scale. That'll, that'll work as well. 
So something like this. And yeah, my text kind of beats my camera move, but that's not a big deal. I also might want to do a little bit of Z rotation here as well. So maybe something like this, just for a little bit of added interest. And then when it gets to the end here, something like, I don't know, like that. Maybe push this up this way and over that way. You know, whatever feels kind of right. Then I'm going to grab all my keyframes, press F9, jump into the graph editor. And just like before, I'm going to pull this handle out to like 80 something and then pull this handle to like 50 or close to it. I don't know. That's probably fine. And then let's just preview how this looks here. So kind of whip around, which is kind of nice just to catch the end animation. And actually I can pull these keyframes closer to the beginning here. So maybe, maybe I start this at closer to one second so we can just see this starting to ride on and then just get to the end there. Pretty cool. I think it looks really nice. If you want to add depth of field, that would probably look pretty cool. Uh, you're going to have to turn the aperture up. I like to go something like, I don't know, 80 maybe, and then change the iris shape to pentagon. Uh, fast rectangle renders very quickly, but it doesn't look very awesome. And then you're going to have to animate the focus distance uh, because by default, it's definitely not going to be right. So I'm just going to drop a keyframe here and pull this back to, it's probably like 800 or something in that neighborhood. Basically, whenever you see that kind of sharp there, yeah, something like that. And I'll just easy ease that and then I'll jump to the end here. And I don't know if I have to adjust it much here, but I'll just move it so it adds another keyframe, you know, something like that I think looks pretty good. And then I'll hop to the middle and just make sure that in the middle, I push this out so that it gets nice and sharp again. So we can kind of see in the middle, it's still acceptably sharp. So let's kind of preview this and see what we have going on here. I think this is going to look pretty cool. That's pretty much it. I think it looks great. And if you wanted to, uh, one thing that I think that looks pretty cool is to take this blurred ink here and push this down a couple of frames so that we get the main kind of text coming in. And then the bigger kind of ink bleed sort of happens after that, right? And I'm just going to hit AA on the camera and turn off depth of field for a second so we can see this a little more clearly. So you can see this, that kind of uh, bigger ink bleed is happening a little bit later as it kind of soaks in, you know, we're pretending. You see, see that there? I think that looks pretty cool. Yeah, very cool. Now you can turn motion blur on if you want, if that's your thing. We'll re-enable uh, depth of field. And that's pretty much it. Now you're good to go. You've got a really slick looking title here with this animated write on and with these other assets that you can find on Envato Elements, you can get a really cool kind of ink bleed effect, adding some effects in After Effects. Final step is to just add this to the render queue, you name it whatever you like and tell it to uh, render wherever you want and you're good to go. Well, that about does it for this tutorial. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed what you saw and I hope you learned a little bit in After Effects, especially how to use this pretty cool looking animated typeface. Once again, my name is Dave Bodie for Envato and I'll see you around.